Toastmasters and guests, it is my pleasure to welcome international president-elect, distinguished Toastmaster Richard E. Peck. Welcome to the World Championship of Public Speaking. Thank you for joining us for this virtual event. Though you cannot see those watching with you today, you are one of tens of thousands of Toastmasters members and guests viewing from around the world. There are people following the competition on social media, and if you'd like to join the conversation, use the hashtag TIGlobalConnect2020. This is one of Toastmasters' most exciting events. Eight of our most talented Toastmasters are here to compete for the title of 2020 Toastmaster World Champion of Public Speaking. For these finalists, it has been nearly a year long process. The International Speech Contest begins with more than 30,000 members competing at the club level and culminates in the semifinals. All 2020 International Speech Contest participants accepted an additional challenge when the contest was moved online partway through the contest cycle. Like true Toastmasters, they have demonstrated flexibility and adaptability. On Tuesday and Wednesday, 28 semifinalists represented their regions in an attempt to make it to the ultimate speaking competition, the World Championship. Today's contestants are Aaron Sampson, Lindy McLean, Linda Marie Miller, Benjamin Wyo, Sherwood Jones, Maureen Zapala, Mike Carr, Kwong Yu Yang. Since 1938, Toastmasters has recognized 79 world champions. A list recognizing all who have earned this title is provided on the virtual convention agenda page. Now, join me in welcoming our contest chair for this event, First Vice President, Distinguished Toastmaster, Margaret Page. Bonjour, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are watching from. Welcome. What an inspiration it has been to have all of you here today at one of our most anticipated events. Thank you for joining us virtually to cheer on our talented contestants. Today, we are making history. We have more Toastmasters and guests watching live from around the world than any other time in our history. This provides an exciting and much deserved opportunity for our contestants' words of wisdom and message of hope for a better tomorrow to spread and have impact around the world. For the first time in Toastmasters history, everyone in attendance has a front row seat to this exciting contest. If you would like to relive the excitement of today's contest, you can stream it again on the Toastmasters International website. Please keep in mind that each contestant selects their own speech topic. Some of the content may be personal in nature and contains language, ideas, or beliefs that some audiences may consider sensitive. This is the world's preeminent speaking competition, and in order to ensure fairness to all contestants, there are a few rules that must be followed. When a contestant is speaking, all other contestants will remain muted with cameras off. We will observe one minute of silence between each contestant, so please be respectful of this courtesy. Are the timers ready? Yes. Chief Judge, are we ready to proceed? Yes. 
Let the speech contest begin. Aaron Sampson, the role you're meant to play, the role you're meant to play, Aaron Sampson. I was three years old going to preschool. My teacher was encouraging creative play. And while the other kids were painting, I was pouring dirt in my mouth, imagining a chocolate milkshake. After school that day, I held my mom's hand as my teacher pulled my mom aside and told her, I don't know how to tell you this, but Aaron is a mentally challenged child. My mom was concerned. She rushed me to the doctor. The doctor took her concerns very seriously. After lots of questions, lots of tests, he said, I think I know what's going on here. He wrote a prescription, handed it to my mom. It said, find a new teacher. Contest chair, friends. After that prescription, my mom moved me to a new school. She looked me in the eye and said, you're gonna be a big thinker. But I was a confused kid and told people, I'm gonna be a big drinker. As I got older, I wanted to find my role in life. But how do you find the role you're meant to play? I proudly say, I'm an artist. That's my role. I moved to Hollywood and write a play. I perform this play for huge crowds in old age homes. After one show, I meet a lonely and blunt 86-year-old named Dr. Joe. Dr. Joe pokes me and says, I could hear you. Great show. Dr. Joe and I become close friends and I care for him like he's my own grandpa. I record his life story. He teaches me how to set life goals and tells me, you should audition for movie roles. But the only roles in my life are the bread rolls that I serve as a waiter. After 10 long years of rejection, I still call myself an artist, but I feel like a failure and I'm told to find a new role by both my heart and my wallet. So I go to MBA school to become a businessman. That's my new role. After school, I land a job as a manager. And what's the first thing I do? Make my business cards. What better way to show my role? I work hard, set life goals, get a few promotions. Then people start asking me for career advice. I mentor a struggling young student named Lucy. Lucy is not sure what to do with her life, so I coach her to set life goals. Lucy works hard and she becomes the first in her family to go to college. She tells me, you taught me how to find my dream role. But when it comes to my life, there's always a bigger role. At a networking event, I say, I'm a director. Someone else says, I'm a VP. I say, I'm an MBA. <laughs> Someone else says, I'm a DTM. I'm not one of those. In fact, I'm not a lot of things. And instead of feeling good about what I am, I feel bad about what I'm not. Do you ever feel that your role isn't enough? I tell myself, I have a wife. I have three kids. 
I'm a family man. Of course, that's my role. Back at the networking event, someone asked me, what do you do? I say, I'm a dad. And she says, that's great. Do you do that full time? And I say, no, I'm also a husband. And then she looks at me like I'm a little weird. I'm just trying to find a role that I can feel proud of. Then one day, I'm at the park with my family, playing trains in the sand with my little three-year-old boy, Cooper. I ask my wife, honey, why do you love me? Is it because I'm a dad, a husband, a breadwinner? My wife gazes in my eyes and she says, who said I love you? <laughs> then she says, I love you because you care for others and because you're weird. I turn to my son, Cooper. What about you, bud? Why do you love me? He says, I love you play trains. And then he picks up two fistfuls of sand, throws them in the air and shouts, it's snowing. And as I gently brush the snow out of Cooper's eyes and mouth, I remember my chocolate milkshake days. And I realize it's not about what roles I play. It's about how I play with others. Whether I'm with Dr. Joe, Lucy, or Cooper, I'm caring, imaginative, and a little weird. Fellow Toastmasters, I've learned my role is not the parts I perform, not the titles on my card. It's how I show care for others. That's the role I'm meant to play. What role can you play in others' lives? Maybe you know a lonely old guy like Dr. Joe, or a struggling young student like Lucy, or a dirt-eating three-year-old like me. How can you show care? Because when you show care for others, others show care for you, and you can proudly say, you found the role you're meant to play. One minute of silence for the judges, please. Lindy McLean, your buried story, your buried story, Lindy McLean. It's six o'clock in the morning after a sleepless overnight flight. I'm standing on the arrivals curb in the Orlando, Florida airport. My heart is in my throat, my stomach doing flip flops. The consequences of having told my buried story are coming at me like a freight train. Contest chair, fellow Toastmasters, it's your fault. You created the incubator in which I told my buried story and came face to face with my regrets. My friend, there is a story that you never tell anyone because you're afraid they'll find out the truth and think less of you. That is your buried story. At 17 years old, 
I returned to the US after an indescribable year as an exchange student in Peru. I had my two duffel bags, a second language, and a second family back in Peru. Mom, Dad, I'm home. Did you miss me? Lindy, your father and I are separating. <sighs> if you've been through a family crisis, you know how everything else falls away. No one wanted to hear from me. I swallowed my Peruvian year whole. I shoved my story deep down inside. I left home for college. I buried my story for years because I didn't know any different. A couple of intense years passed. My parents decided to mend their marriage. Now I could focus on my other family. The occasional letter I'd been sending to Peru came back marked return to sender. I had no other address, no telephone number, no way to track them. I had lost touch with my second family. The truth is, I did not try hard enough to find them. Beside my buried story, I planted a seed of regret that over the years would grow into a vicious weed. A few years ago, as a fairly new Toastmaster, in my quest for speech material, I heard a little voice. Tell your story. What? Not that story. No way. Well, but I'm not telling all of it. I don't want them to know I'm guilty of losing touch. I told a few vignettes from my life-changing year in Peru. People actually laughed. Okay, I'll tell my story. Have you used Toastmasters to develop a single story? Have you told it again and again, receiving feedback, revising? Have you surrendered to that process like clay in the hands of a sculptor? I did. And I received treasure beyond measure. My Peruvian family came alive again in my mind. My mother, meet my American daughter. She sings soprano and she dances ballet. My father, Lindy, buenos dias, no, buenos dias. Marty Lou, 13. Para baila la bamba. Dance, Lindy. Dante, 12. Adorable. He could conquer the world with a twinkle in his eye. Little Talia. She expressed her feelings for me as only a six year old can. Baby Gonzalito, big brown eyes, just learning to walk. The memories poured in and my heart grew. My regrets went wild. What had happened to these people that I loved? Why had I let them go? I felt sad, sorry, ashamed, guilty, feeling all of that. I finally did what I should have done ages ago. I began to look for them. First stop, that website that you use to find lost people, you know, Facebook. I found my sister Marilu first. Do you know, there is something eternal about voices. I wish I had words to tell you what it was like picking up my phone and hearing her voice as if she were still 13. Marilu? Lindy, it's really you. We talked and we talked. It turns out in difficult times, the entire family had left Peru and they were now living in Orlando, Florida, only six hours away from me by plane. I'm standing on the arrivals curb at the Orlando, Florida airport. My heart, my stomach. Will we still like each other? Will four days be way too long? The consequences of telling my buried story are now pulling up to the curb. 
out steps my Peruvian mother. One look and tears. Mamita, hola, como estas? Liti, you have not changed one bit. Really? After 40 years? She still loves me. I spent four unforgettable days reconnecting with my family, my parents, Talia, Dante, Marilu, their six children, and of course, baby Gonzalito. My friend, you are the hero of this story. Without you, this platform, your encouragement, this life-changing reunion would not have happened for me. The question is, Hero, will you heed the call? I told my buried story and I got a brand new ending. What if when you tell your buried story, a new ending awaits? Tell your buried story. Tell your story. Contest chair. One minute of silence for the judges, please. Linda Marie Miller, pretending not to know. Pretending not to know, Linda Marie Miller. If you're ready to change the world, but you don't know how, I have the key. It's just a question, but it's the most powerful question in the world. The question is, what are you pretending not to know? That question changed my life. What was I pretending not to know? I find out when I helped my friend Tony and his son Michael. Michael was not your typical teenager. Once he convinced his father to let him bring a homeless boy into their house. Michael shared everything with that young man and gave up his own bed until that boy got back on his feet. In college, Michael excelled. As a freshman, he tutored seniors in chemistry. He loved science. He loved so, science so much, he enrolled his professors and fellow classmates into assisting him as he delivered a science experiment for blind children so that they could experience the love of science that he had. Michael was the whole package. A brilliant mind, a caring heart, a dutiful son, and Tony was so proud. Then the phone call came. Michael is dead. Hit by a car 600 miles from home on a college field trip. I jumped into action to help my friend Tony, who was too grief stricken to even think about bringing Michael's body home or planning a funeral. I phoned the hospital, who told me Michael's body would not be released until testing was completed. Testing for drugs, testing for alcohol. The police department was called for a copy of the police report. Had the driver been drinking, speeding, talking on their phone? The police said they talked to the woman that hit Michael and she said she hadn't been drinking or speeding. They had no reason to doubt her. Using Tony's Airbnb account, I logged on 
to seek accommodations for the many family and friends that would be arriving for the funeral. None of the reservations were accepted. Thinking there must be song with something wrong with Tony's account, I logged on using my Airbnb account and the exact same properties were immediately accepted. What do you think's going on? How could this be? This is my friend, Tony. I've been pretending not to know that I am a blonde haired, blue eyed, pale skinned beneficiary of a system controlled by people that look like me. I live a life of white privilege while Tony has trouble seeking accommodations for his grieving family members. I live a life of white privilege while this amazing young boy on his way to medical school is profiled even after his death, suspected of drug use or being up to no good for simply crossing the street. This amazing young man who once brought a homeless boy into his house, a white homeless boy, his death dismissed based on the color of his skin. The white woman that killed Michael wasn't tested for drugs or alcohol. She wasn't even suspected of speeding, even though she had a long history of speeding tickets. The more I thought about it, the angrier I became. This is discrimination. This is racism. I was comforted by the fact that I am not a racist. I have never discriminated against anyone. In my career, I have hired many amazing black people. When my son was young, his best friend was black. Hey, I live in a very diverse neighborhood. All my neighbors are black and they like me. I have never used a racial slur or told a racial joke in my entire life. I've been pretending not to know that I am the problem. I remained silent when I saw racism in my family for fear of being disinherited. I remained silent when I saw racism at work for fear of not being promoted. I always blamed it on a broken system, but guess what? The system is working exactly the way it was designed to. In exchange for my silence, the system has made sure I don't have to worry about anything. I don't worry about someone wanting to harm my son. I don't worry about being discriminated against at work. I don't worry about being watched by security guards when I go shopping. And I don't have to worry about being shot if I am stopped by the police. My silence has benefited me at the expense of others. And I will remain silent no more. I now use my voice as an ally for and with people of color. I am committed to helping create a system that works for everyone, not just people that look like me. Look around. Look around at the world today. Don't you agree it's in need of a little change? Fellow Toastmasters, you have the most powerful voices on the planet. Commit right here and now to create the change that you want to see in the world. Let's create a world where there's no race but the human race, one shared humanity. All it takes is finding your truth. And all that takes is one powerful question. So go ahead, ask yourself. Madam Contest Chair. One minute of silence for the judges, please.
Benjamin Wyo, Poster Perfect. Poster Perfect, Benjamin Wyo. Have you ever fallen in love? In your dreams? As a teenager, I had the most unforgettable dream about the most incredible girl. We were sitting on a soft white rug in a large room. I held her hand, she held my heart. We were so in love. The only trouble was, I couldn't see her face and didn't know what she looked like. Strangely enough, I knew exactly what she felt like. She felt so good right here. Mm. So I vowed that when I fall in love, it would be like my dream. It wouldn't matter what she looked like, tall, dark, short, thin. It would only matter what she felt like right here. Have you ever felt something so strong right here? Contest here, my friends. Despite having such a powerful experience, something happened that made me forget my vow to my dream girl. It was a day that I met the poster girl. Now, this was in the 90s, the days of Michael Jackson. Madonna and Bobby Brown. Everyone wanted life-size posters of these celebrities. Did you ever do that? <laughs> My big brothers and I were not going to be left out. So we went to the store to get a poster for our bedroom wall. And we all agreed that it must be a pop star. All that changed when we arrived and I stood face to face with the picture of the most beautiful woman I had ever seen in my life. She was a supermodel with the most amazing figure and an enchanting smile that seemed to say, you know you want me. Mm! She must be mine, I announced. My brothers protested. They wanted Michael Jackson, but I was very convincing. Please, please, oh please. They gave it. Ooh, yes! I made sure that we placed her at the foot of my bed so that she'd be the first thing I saw in the morning and the last thing at night. And it wouldn't matter what part of the room I was in, she would still be looking at me. And I would say, Oh, I see you too, baby. I see you. <laughs> Mwah. Life was perfect. Poster, perfect. Then the weirdest thing happened one morning. I woke up from that dream, took a long look at the face of my poster perfect love and thought, what in the world did I see in this woman? All the beauty had suddenly vanished. Unbelievable. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it wasn't long before I began to paint a mustache under her nose and whiskers on her cheeks. Not long after that, I destroyed her face and the poster altogether. Funny, right? But this taught me something. You may fall for beauty, but you're going to live with a person. You may fall in love with a beautiful face, but if all she is is just a beautiful face, then you might just wake up one day and begin to hurt the same person that you once proclaimed on dying love for. Though she was perfect, she was incapable of evoking that special feeling right here. I remembered my dream girl. It didn't matter what she looked like, remember? What mattered was how she felt right here. So I had to find her and search for her in every woman I met. Until one day at a party, I met this fine girl. Ooh, she was hot. 
plus size poster perfect. <laughs> but I didn't want another poster girl on my hands. So I wanted to get to know her. And so I did. One date after another, and I discovered that she was my dream girl. Why? Because she felt so good right here. It wasn't in her face or her figure. No, it was in her laugh. Her values, our disagreements, the time spent apart, and the joy of coming back together again. We had that connection, and it only grew stronger and stronger. And her name is Julia, my amazing wife today. My friends, you and I will continue to meet people that may become a part of our lives for different reasons. For love, friendship, business, Toastmasters. It doesn't matter if these people look picture perfect. No, what matters is who they are, what they stand for, and what they do to us right here. Scientists say it takes about two years to fall out of love with anyone. But after almost 20 years of knowing her, Julia is still my dream girl. She's not a picture perfect poster on my wall. No, she's love pasted permanently on the walls of my heart. Right here. Contest chair. One minute of silence for the judges, please. Sherwood Jones, things have changed. Things have changed, Sherwood Jones. All right, children, gather around, gather around. It's story time once again. <laughs> I know little Susie was asking me about what life was like when I was a young man. I think sometimes she doesn't think I was ever a young man. Well, sir, Grandpa's going to tell you. I, back a few years ago, was drop-dead gorgeous. All the way back in the year 2019. <laughs> well, I tell you, things have changed. See, back in the day, life was very different. We had these big buildings with stages and lights and seats. And then we'd have these things they call rock concerts. And had all these crazy young people in the seats jumping up and down like caffeinated jackrabbits. And we also had these things that were called bowling alleys and movie theaters. Uh, that's kind of like watching Netflix in a room with a lot of talkative strangers. Oh, things were definitely different. We would do crazy things like we would shake hands and give each other hugs. And we didn't have to walk around looking like surgeons. And we didn't have to walk around with a six foot bubble around us in all directions. Well, 
things have changed. Uh, what's that, Susie? Uh, you're muted. You have to hit that button in the lower left-hand corner. Oh, oh, I see. Yes, I admit that uh, there have been a lot of things that we've lost ever since the start of, start of, the C word. Contest chair, ladies and gentlemen, and my friends. I don't have to tell you what the C word is. Uh, we hear it every day on the news. We read it every day on signs. We see it on television advertisements, advertising goods and services. It's become the 800 pound gorilla standing in the corner of the room and has become so much a part of our life that I don't even have to tell you the word. Things have changed. If you're like grandpa, well, you have become very frustrated by the fact that our lives have become abbreviated. Annual events that take place with the vibrant energy of a thousand souls all together have been reduced to a webcam and postage size mug shots of people on a computer screen. And you, just you. 2019 seems like it was 19 years ago. When the tangible is ripped away from us, we have to hold all the more to the intangible. We all know that the Grinch can steal the glitz and glamour from our lives, but he cannot take away its heart. Well, I know that there's been a lot of trouble and, trouble and problems that have taken place, and they've been incredibly frustrating. But despite all of it, there is one good thing that I have found in this situation. It's the most important thing in our lives, our connection with other people. Oh, well, it's, it's a known fact, of course, that the more time that we do spend at home as a result of the C word, the better connection that we have with our family. And of course, thanks to these little plastic electronic devices, we can now link back with old friends that we haven't seen in years, sometimes intentionally haven't seen in years. But the interesting thing is that we can also connect with people that we never thought we would be connected with. I always loved when it snowed. I mean, yes, we could throw snowballs and build snowmen and, and just drive all over town and there would be snow, snow, snow everywhere. But the really interesting thing was that no matter where in the town I went, everybody was dealing with the same frozen experience. And we were united by that same problem. And boy, do we have a blizzard now. As soon as my Toastmasters Club went online, we put the Zoom link on a Google Doc and we started receiving guests from all over the place. Hi, I'm from Wisconsin. Welcome. Hi, I'm from Japan. I'm from London. Welcome. Welcome. Hi, I'm from Russia. I'm from Afghanistan. I'm from Iraq. Welcome. Things have changed. You see, I've learned that we really have no enemies. It doesn't matter what your language is, what you speak, what your religion is, whether you eat borscht or curry or fried chicken. We are all together as one people. Thanks to the 800 pound gorilla that wants to destroy us physically and emotionally, we have a common enemy and we are all one. How has the C word affected your life? 
Have you become angry and frustrated? Or have you taken the opportunity to connect with other people, old friends hundreds of miles away, or new friends half a world away? When we finally come out of this fog, I realize that there will be a lot of differences between now and 2019. But I hope that one of them, one of the side effects, is a newfound appreciation for people that we have never seen and never met before. And we can say things have changed. Contest chair. One minute of silence for the judges, please. Maureen Zapala, it's so good to see you. It's so good to see you, Maureen Zapala. You should have heard what she said to me. Maureen, look at you. You are fat, ugly, and stupid. You failed at marriage. You're a terrible mother, a lousy housekeeper, and you think people like you? They don't. Can you believe she said that? I can, because she's me. The voice was in my head. Now maybe you're thinking, wow, Maureen, I'm really surprised because you look pretty confident and put together. Well, you see the outside, but on the inside, I sometimes still hear a voice that says, Maureen, you're worthless. Do you ever hear that voice in your head? Does it call you Maureen? Contest chair, friends, you're not worthless. None of, none of us are. Why do we still believe it? Why do we let that chatter suck the life right out of us? There must be a way to silence it. And there is. But you must be willing to do something. Something that I learned in college the summer of my junior year, I was in the hospital laying on an x-ray table with horrible pain shooting down my legs. I was miserable and embarrassed. The pain had me in bed for days. For four days, I hadn't changed or showered or shaved. I felt like moldy bread and that voice Look at you, Maureen. You've got greasy hair, smelly body, furry pits. You look like trash. You smell like it, too. Then I heard another voice that wasn't in my head. It was the x-ray technician. He said, Maureen, is that you? It's been years. Wow, it's so good to see you. Oh no, it was Dan Saxtetter, my senior prom date. What are the chances I'd run into him? I guess pretty good. You know, when you're at your worst, you have the best chance of seeing an old flame. <sighs> you see, in high school, everyone loved Dan. He was smart and handsome, captain of the football team. And he liked me. I did not look this good in high school. I didn't look this good four hours ago. I don't apply makeup. I install it. 
Oh, but the prom, oh, it was a magical date. And our only date. And we lost touch after high school. So imagine how I felt a few years later, inserted in his machine, stinking up that room. Oh, and he looked so good. Hi, Dan, it's, it's good to see you too. It was a lie. I was so ashamed and I just wanted to vanish. Then Dan took my hand, found my eyes and said, Maureen, I know you're hurting and, and we'll help. But wow, it's so good to see you. That moment when he found my eyes, he looked through those flaws and spoke life to my worth. That simple phrase, it's so good to see you, shattered the shame and I felt safe and special, like royalty, like that prom queen I never was. Now, I still had pain. In fact, I needed surgery for a ruptured disc. He didn't, he didn't relieve the pain, but he restored my dignity. And he silenced that voice that said, Maureen, you're worthless. But then there was a new voice that said, gosh, I wonder if he's single. What Dan did for me is what we must do for each other. It wasn't just his words, it was his eyes. They drilled down to the source of my shame and gave me what I desperately wanted, what we all want, acceptance. I didn't just hear his words, I felt them because I saw them. He found my eyes. And that spoke life to my worth. The way to silence that voice, it's not to find Dan, it's to be Dan for other people. We need this today more than ever. We're isolated and almost afraid of each other. People are scanning the horizon, looking for eyes to connect with, a heart to connect with, even if only through their eyes. Your job? Find their eyes, mask or no mask, find their eyes and speak life to their worth. Give them the acceptance they want. You know how it feels. Someone's probably done it for you. It's exhilarating and life-giving and it lingers. I saw Dan 40 years ago. He has no idea I still tell this story. I have no idea if he's still single. We must do this for each other. Find their eyes and speak life to their worth. I can't see your eyes right now, but when I do, know this. It's so good to see you. Contest chair. One minute of silence for the judges, please.
Mike Carr, the librarian and Mrs. Montgomery. The librarian and Mrs. Montgomery, Mike Carr. I was spellbound as I watched the sheriff who had just been shot slide back, open that heavy metal door, stagger forward a couple of steps, look deep into the camera and say, I before E except after C. Contest chair, fellow Toastmasters, I was in the sixth grade in Mrs. Montgomery's class watching an educational video where a sheriff was teaching us about writing while a bad guy named Bad English was shooting at him. It was on a film projector because we were technology challenged in my school. And as I watched that film, all of a sudden something started looking strange. The film slowed down. And when it picked back up, it made a sound like and it looked like it was blinking. Then the sheriff was talking to us from the side of the screen. The blinking started again with a loud noise. Everything went blank. I ran to the front and I turned off the projector. I opened it up. Something smelled like it was burning. Mrs. Montgomery, I said, can I try to fix this? After school, she said. An hour after the final bell rang, I had disassembled the entire projector all over the floor. I was beginning to put it back together when the librarian came strolling through. What are you doing? She almost screamed at me. Who told you you could do this? I did, said Mrs. Montgomery. The librarian, though, zeroed in on me. This is school property, and it better work when you get it all back together again. If it doesn't work, your parents are going to have to pay for that. Now, my parents did not have a lot of money. If I went home and told them they had to replace a projector at school, I would have been better off in the hands of that bad guy, bad English. And so, with focused energy, I started putting the projector back together. After two hours, it was whole. And Mrs. Montgomery said, let's try it. I reached up and I flipped the on switch and there out in front of us, projected onto the screen in all of its glory was nothing, nothing. The projector was dead. Mrs. Montgomery put her arm around me and she said, it's okay that you took the risk to try to fix it. The victory is not in the result. The victory is in the try. But I still had to tell my parents. When I got home, I snuck in and I thought, if I just hide in my closet, they'll forget I exist. But then I heard from the kitchen, Mike, come in. I walked in and I said, Mom, Dad, there's something I have to tell you. I love you. <laughs> And I am scared of sheriffs. I don't know. I ran to my room. I choked. I couldn't think of anything to say. I thought I'll tell them tomorrow. I crawled on my bed and I looked up at the ceiling and I thought, how do I get to Norway? Now, I know there are people from Norway in the audience. And can I just tell you, I don't know why Norway was my only safe haven on this planet at that point. Maybe I thought that Norway had made a deal with the UN that they would not let crazy librarians come into their country. But at that night, I drifted off to a very restless sleep, dreaming of swimming to Norway. I was awakened with a jolt when my alarm went off the next morning. As I got ready for the day, I was sick to my stomach. When I got to school, I knew my time was up. I slunk to the library to find Mrs. Landon sitting there reading her newspaper. She was drinking out of this coffee mug. That's concerning. I approached her and I told her the final fate of her projector. She slowly started looking up at me. Her lips started curling. Then she leaned forward and said, fine. What, 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 what just happened? I, I'm still alive. I could not believe it. My failure 
had not killed me. And yours will not kill you. What was it that Mrs. Montgomery said? The victory is not in the result. The victory is in the try. Ever since then, I have walked through life with a little librarian Landon sitting on this shoulder and a Mrs. Montgomery sitting on this shoulder. When I tried and gave my very first speech, which was a train wreck, Mrs. Landon told me, you should never try that again. But Mrs. Montgomery reminded me that the failure had taught me lessons that could be a springboard to future success. And she was right. But her words ring even more true for you. And let me tell you why I know this. For years, Toastmasters has been the place where leaders are made. You are here in some way to increase your leadership skill. And this world desperately needs leaders who will create fertile soil for innovation to grow. Toastmasters is a great example. When COVID hit this year, they could have said, no, we're just going to cancel the contest. We'll cancel the convention and we'll pick it up again next year. But instead, they decided to try something new, this virtual experience. And yes, there have been glitches, but that's what, inf that's what innovation is like. Glitches happen. And the lessons that they have learned take us miles beyond those organizations that just canceled. If you want to lead people to fix persistent problems, someday, somewhere, somebody is going to have to try something new. And you as the leader have the opportunity to encourage that effort, that effort that might fail for a chance to find the future. The victory is in the try. Be a Montgomery leader. Encourage risk. Try new things. The victory is not in the result, my friends. The victory is in the try. Contest chair. One minute of silence for the judges, please. Huang Yu Yang, knock, knock, Kuang Yu Yang. Growing up in Australia as a little Chinese boy, my parents always told me that there were three things I could be. A lawyer, a doctor, or a failure. Now at nine years old, having a career path wasn't really on my to-do list. The one thing that I really wanted was the same thing that most other kids would want. It doesn't matter how old you are, what color your skin is, or where you're from. The one thing that most kids want is to be liked by the other little kids. Now at nine years old, being liked equaled being cool. Problem was, I wasn't cool. Bowl-shaped haircut, not cool. Maths nerd, not cool. And speaking funny English wasn't cool. But in my search for coolness, I did find one thing that gave me hope. And that was 
Kung Fu. You see, my idol at the time was Jackie Chan, a famous Hong Kong movie star that would climb up buildings, jump off trees, and kick everybody's ass. I figured, Jackie's got black hair. I've got black hair. Jackie speaks funny English. I speak funny English. Jackie's a Kung Fu master, so I must be a Kung Fu master. And then when I find out from my parents that Jackie's going to be eating in a Chinese restaurant in my hometown, I'm over the moon because I have a plan. I'll go to the restaurant, I'll get a photo, I'll get an autograph, I'll show the other kids and I will be cool. And so the next day, I convinced my parents to take me to this Chinese restaurant called Great Wall. We sit down, the waiter comes by, and we find out that Jackie is in the private room. It's up some stairs, up on the platform, up to the side. And so I walk up the stairs and I go towards the private room. There are these two big white doors that I can't see through. So I stand there and I get ready to knock. but I can't do it. And so my nine-year-old brain says, hey, let's just wait till Jackie comes out of the room and then we'll bump into him accidentally. And so I run back down to my table. I sit down and I stare at the doors. I stare at the doors for an hour. Jackie doesn't come out. I'm thinking, dude, don't you need to go to toilet? I know I do. And then I look down and all the food on our table is almost gone. I'm running out of time. So I tell my parents that I'm still hungry and they order some more sweet and sour pork. I sit there and I eat as slowly as I can. 30 minutes passed, no Jackie, my parents say to me, you have to go knock on that door or we're going home. So I walk up the stairs and I go towards those two big white doors. I'm ready to knock and I can't do it. My knees are shaking, my heart is pumping and my body is shivering. And then this inner voice starts yelling at me, knock on the door. Just do it. It's not that hard. Just do it. You're wearing Nikes. Just do it. And then another voice yells, your Nikes are fake. You can't do it. Suddenly the doors burst open. I think it's Jackie Chan. <gasps> but it's a lady in a blue dress. She walks out of the room, so I quickly pretend as if I just happen to be walking by. I run back down to my parents, and my parents say to me, go knock on that door, or we're going home. And so I go back up to those two white doors. I realize I can't knock. And I realize I'm never going to be cool. And I start to cry. And I don't know how long I'm crying for, but the lady in the blue dress walks back up. She walks around me and walks back into the room. I quickly run back down to the table and I'm hoping that the tears in my eyes will convince my parents to go knock on the door for me. They stand up, but they put on their jackets. And I know straight away, they're not doing anything awesome because they're my parents. And they want me to learn a life lesson. But the only lesson I learn is that I feel helpless and I can't get through my door, which is both physical and mental. And so I stand up, I put on my jacket, I know I'm going home empty-handed and I look at the door one more time 
and I see Jackie Chan with this great big smile. He starts walking down the steps and behind him is the lady in the blue dress. She whispers in his ears and points to me. Jackie comes over and he says, I hear that there's somebody I need to meet. I get a photo, I get an autograph, and I am over the moon. That night, a lady's little act of kindness gave this little boy hope. Now every day there is someone somewhere trying their best, but they're struggling to open their door. And sometimes a simple knock doesn't feel that simple. And so if you ever see someone struggle, it doesn't matter how old they are, what color their skin is or where they're from, help them open the door because what the world needs now more than ever is hope. And if you want to wear a blue dress, that's up to you. Please remain silent until the judges have completed their ballots.
All right, the judges have been removed and we will continue on, proceed with the interviews. All of you did an amazing job. We laughed, we cried, and you left us with deeper messages. We'll begin with Aaron Sampson. All right, Aaron, where are you from? Which district are you in and what club are you representing? I am from the San Francisco Bay Area in California. I am representing, proud to represent Stan, San Mateo Storytellers in District 4. All right. So Aaron, you mentioned about the roles that you play in life and the important ones about a father and a husband, but you play another role in something to do with Facebook Kids. Can you tell us about that? Yes, I work at Facebook. Uh, I work on Messenger Kids product, which is a product that shares, it allows children to be able to connect safely with their closest friends and family. Wow, what a worthwhile thing. So how, how much does it take to be trending on Facebook? How many posts do we need to have, Aaron? How many posts do you need to have to be trending on Facebook? Yeah. Um, I, you know what, I, I'm not representing Facebook in the context of this contest, so I can't answer that with certainty, but I promise you that if you put more content out there on any social media platform, you will trend. The most important thing is to put valuable content out there. So if you're able to share your message and get content out there, people will uh, start following you and your content will trend. Well, great. Let's hope today that we can have the trending for the World Championship of Public Speaking and Toastmasters International. We want to thank you so much for your words of wisdom and your message. And uh, congratulations on participating in the 2020 World Championship of Public Speaking. Thank you. It's good to be here. Lindy McLean, it's so nice to have you here with us today. Would you please start with where are you from, what district are you in, and what club sent you here today? Yes, I live in the Pacific Northwest of the United States in Squim, Washington. I am competing out of professionally speaking advanced club from Polesville, Washington. My home club is Squim Toastmasters, and I also belong to Jefferson County Toastmasters. Nice. Now, Lindy, I know that you're an author and have written several books. Uh, perhaps give us the name of one of your books, but let's hear the distinction between writing a speech and writing a book. What are the similarities or the differences? I'd be delighted. I've written a middle grade fantasy adventure series. The first book is called The Curse of the Neverland. Uh, it's a modern day spinoff of the Neverland starring girls. Writing novels is long, obviously. One of the major differences is word count. M my books have somewhere around 75,000 words. A five to seven minute speech has between 600 and 900 words or something like that. But I will tell you that there is so much in common and I have learned so many things speaking that will help me when I begin writing again. For instance, don't go off on long narratives. Use dialogue to cut into the scene briefly. Make sure you have a powerful opening. People's attention span is short. They'll close the book immediately if they don't get engaged in the first few sentences. Uh, and action. Keep with action. Don't sag too much. Just so many parallels. I've learned a lot as a speaker. All right. Well, thank you so much for your message and your words of wisdom. Congratulations for participating in the 2020 World Championship of Public Speaking. <laughs> Linda Marie Miller, share with us where you're from, which district you're in, and what club you are representing. I live in Durham, North Carolina, in the United States of America. My district 
is an interesting answer. When this contest started, I was in District 37, and I'm here representing 37. But halfway through this contest, the district split. So I have to give a shout out to District 117, which is now the district that I'm in. The name of my home club is Figure of Speech, but I'm also a member of another club called Duke Toastmasters. Thank you. Now, Linda Marie, I know your runway to the World Championship has been pretty short. Share with mm -hmm. us how long you've been a Toastmaster and what message you would give those that are just being introduced to Toastmasters for the first time today? Well, I'll start with that. If someone invites you to a Toastmasters meeting, go. The person that invited me to my first Toastmasters meeting is Tony. I have learned so much in Toastmasters. It has been one of the most rewarding experiences of my life. And it is truly a huge way to make a difference in the world, both through helping other Toastmasters and also sharing your message with the world. Well, thank you for your words of wisdom today and your message. Congratulations on participating in the 2020 World Championship of Public Speaking. Thank you. Benjamin Wyo. tell us where you are from, what district you are in, and what club you are representing. I am from the motherland. I'm from Nigeria, West Africa, representing Region 11, District 94. And of course, my club is Apple Hill Diamonds Club in Abuja, the capital of Nigeria, Division E. Thank you. Now, in your profile, I read that you're a veterinarian. And can you share with us a story about, pardon me? Yes, can you share with us yes, I am. a story about an animal and a lesson learned from an animal? Wow, that would be a difficult one. And I'm not James Harriet. I'm not exactly full of so many stories. But in any case, I could tell you about how I became a veterinarian. I was in my fifth year of secondary school, my penultimate year of what you may call high school. And I, I, I realized that I loved animals, I loved biology, and I felt being the veterinary doctor would be the next best thing. I could wake up 3 a.m. and go treat animals and I'd be okay. So I went into school based on that. And I love the job. It's actually exciting being able to treat people, treat, I call them people, <laughs> being able to treat special people that can't tell you what they feel and you just have to figure it out by looking at so many signs. And I, I, it's quite fulfilling. I, I find it very exciting. Every day on the job is an exciting one. Well, thank you for your deep caring about people and your deep caring about special people. Thank you yes. for your <laughs> today. And congratulations in participating in the 2020 World Championship of Public Speaking. Sherwood Jones, where are you from? What district are you in? And what club do you represent? I'm living in Nacogdoches, Texas, although I just got here in January from Los Angeles. I am representing District 50, and the club is Shreveport Club. And I've been in Toastmasters. I was in Toastmasters in Los Angeles, District 1, for Quite a long time. So I understand that you're a film editor and a film instructor. Share with us what you took from that industry that you've been able to apply to virtual presentations. Well, I think that in general, if you work in film, you're aware of so many different elements, and particularly in the virtual environment, how the frame works, how the lighting, the framing, the composition, the 
closeness or the farthest away that you are from the camera helps to connect with the audience emotionally. And I love audience psychology, both in filmmaking and in public speaking. Well, thank you for your message and your words of wisdom. Congratulations for participating in the 2020 World Championship of Public Speaking. Maureen Zapala, it is good to see you. Good callback. <laughs> Share with us where you're from, what district you were in, and what club you were in. I live in Henderson, Nevada, which is a suburb of Las Vegas. I moved here just about a year ago from Cleveland. So I'm currently in a brand new district, District 115, uh, originally from District 10. The club I'm in is Henderson Toasters. I used to live in Henderson at one time, so I like, too. I did. I'd like to hear how your clubs have supported you over the years, Maureen. Well, you know, it, I have a great club, sorry. I have a great club. And I say this frequently when I talk to people, District 10 launched me, District 115 caught me, and I got caught by the best club, Henderson Toasters. It's a, a local club sponsor, or a, uh, it's not a corporate club, but it, resident at the city of Henderson City Hall. So a lot of the members are part of the city of Henderson staff. And this town just has amazing pride and camaraderie and excitement and vision. And it, they're, it's just a great group of people. So they welcomed me as a new person in their club and in the, in the uh, district. And they have just been so supportive, my balcony people, through this whole contest. It's just been phenomenal, phenomenal. I, just, I love them. I love you, Henderson Toasters. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for your message and your words of wisdom. Congratulations in participating in the 2020 World Championship of Public Speaking. Mike Carr, where are you from? What district do you represent? And what club or clubs are you in? I live in Austin, Texas, and I am from District 55. I am in two clubs. I'm representing Austin Toastmasters, and as we like to say, the greatest Toastmasters club in the known universe. Mm -hmm. That's debatable, I think. And I'm also a member, and I owe a great debt of debt gratitude to Laughing Matters Toastmasters, where laughing really matters. Yeah, I think there's several clubs that claim that first title. And so that's <laughs> nice, nice to hear there's so many, the best in the world. Mike, I understand you have eight children, is that correct? Yes, yes, that is. And so they're all future Toastmasters, but tell us about your children, how you ended up with eight and how they help you in your speeches. <laughs> the, way, the, way we, the, the way we ended up with eight really begins with my marriage proposal. I proposed and said, let's have no children and focus on career, travel the world. So that just didn't, work out. <laughs> you saw, we, we had that first baby girl and I was so deeply head over heels in love with her that every time we'd think, well, maybe just one more, we'd say, sure, yeah, this is great. So it is, it is a joyful chaos. It is both of those things, joyful and chaotic. But they, they have experiences. Thankfully, my wife births funny children. And so they give me a lot of information, a lot of, of material to speak about different ways of looking at the world. They challenge me actually in very serious topics. I learn from them now. It's, it's been a really rich experience. So they, they do help me an awful lot, except during this experience, whenever I would walk out into the house and they go, yeah, 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 whatever, you know, world championship of public speaking, I need something to eat. <laughs> Well, I'm sure they're standing on the other side of the door waiting for you to, to bring some food their way. What age are they, Mike? 
my oldest is 29 and then our youngest are a set of twins and they're 13. Oh, nice. Beautiful. Well, congratulations on having an amazing family and sharing with us your message and words of wisdom. Congratulations for participating in the 2020 World Championship of Public Speaking. Oh, thank you. So honored. Kwan Yu Yang, this is uh, not the first time that you have competed in the World Championship of Public Speaking, but please tell us today where you are from, what district do you represent, and what clubs you were in. So I'm originally from Australia, currently in Australia, but the district I am representing is 118, which is all the way in China, uh, just being separated because of what's happening right now. I'm part of three clubs, GEM Toastmasters Club, GAT, and ACCA. They're all based in Guangzhou. Thank you. Of course, this year you're competing in the virtual environment. So how did you have to create and prepare and deliver differently than you would have typically preparing for the World Championship? I would say that they are just totally different formats or different delivery styles. And anything that you would do on a stage doesn't necessarily translate onto screen very well. So big movements, stage usage, it is all really different. And trying to build that connection with the audience is definitely much harder because you don't get feedback. You're just talking to a camera. So you just have to judge with your feelings and to hope that you are connecting. Mm. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for your message and your words of wisdom about hope and the future. And congratulations for participating in the 2020 World Championship of Public Speaking. We congratulate each one of our contestants. We laughed with you, we felt your pain, and we thank you for showing us how to create a better tomorrow. Thank you for participating in the World Championship of Public Speaking. Please welcome back international president-elect, distinguished Toastmaster, Richard E. Peck. Thank you, Margaret. And thank you to the judges, timers, and counters. The Toastmasters International Accredited Speaker Program recognizes those Toastmasters members who have achieved a level of proficiency that enables them to be a paid professional speaker. To be an accredited speaker, a member must give 25 speaking engagements to non-Toastmasters audiences before they are eligible to apply. Applicants must also demonstrate their speaking abilities before a live audience. Applicants progress through two levels of evaluation and are judged by a panel of professional speakers at each level. Since 1981, the accredited speaker program has recognized 87 individual Toastmasters with this prestigious designation. For the 2020 program, there were 21 applicants for level one, during which an applicant's video presentation is evaluated by a panel of judges. In level two, four candidates presented for a live virtual audience and panel of judges. These candidates demonstrated adaptability to our changing global landscape in their willingness to present as professional speakers for an online audience. I am pleased to announce that the following Toastmaster passed level two of the program and is the newest accredited speaker, Mohammed Ali Shukri. We congratulate the newest accredited speaker on this accomplishment. Each year, Toastmasters International conducts a special video speech contest for members of undistricted clubs. Entries for the 2020 competition came from all over the world. 
The third place winner is Javed Bhatti from Karachi, Pakistan. The second place winner is Carol Wakio Enderi from Nairi, Kenya. And the 2020 winner of the video speech contest is Carolyn Gathuru from Nairobi, Kenya. We congratulate these Toastmasters on their outstanding achievements. And now the news we have all been waiting for. Please note that there was one disqualification due to time. The third place winner is Lindy McLean. The second place winner is Linda Marie Miller. And the first place winner in the 2020 World Champion of Public Speaking is Mike Carr. Let us take a moment to recognize our fantastic top three winners in today's contest. Please note that the winner of today's contest will be available for the Virtual Speakers Showcase at 5 p.m. Greenwich Mean Time. During this showcase, the first place winner will deliver acknowledgments and all three winners will answer questions about their journey and experience. The link to access this event is available on the virtual convention agenda page of the Toastmasters International website. The 2020 World Championship of Public Speaking is now adjourned. Thank you for attending.